First of all, let me tell you that uh, we have collectively survived World IPv6 Day. Uh, if you didn't know, IPv6 was turned on around the world starting at midnight GMT, June 8th. Uh, it was shut down in many places, but not everywhere uh, at the end of that 24-hour period. I'm very proud of Google. All of our stuff worked. As far as I know, we didn't have any major flaps, and if there were problems, they often turned out to be configuration problems, which is what we expected. I mean, there are issues associated with the two formats of internet address, and some things are not configured properly. The only way you can find that out is to actually turn everything on and see what breaks. So I'm very happy that uh, this test was uh, initiated by the Internet Society. I expect that there will be more such tests going on between now and you know, until we finally get a significant uh, penetration of IPv6. Uh, in case you aren't aware, we have run out of IPv4 fresh allocations. The Internet uh, the It sounds I like it was an oversight in the Internet's original design. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I've, I have practiced this defense very carefully, so I will, I'll tell you what it is. Bob Kahn and I wrote that 1973 paper, Interconnection of uh, Packet Switch Networks, and we thought that building networks was going to be really expensive, right? That there might be a few per country. After all, we had only built one. It was the ARPANET plus, you know, these little packet radio nets and so on. Um, so we thought, okay, so maybe two per country would be about right. That's eight bits uh, worth of network ID, and then we needed 24 more bits to say which computer it was. That's 32 bits. This, this question got revisited when I became the program manager at DARPA in 1977. The question is, how much address space does the internet need? And remember, the idea gets written down in 1973, right? By 1977, we have done the first three network tests, the packet satellite net, packet radio net, and the ARPA net. That's all we got, it's three networks, and now we're trying to standardize the protocols, and the question is how many bits do we need for addresses? So one group says stick with 32, it seemed to work okay. Another group says, how about variable length addresses? The programmers say, that's a dumbass idea because <laughs> you, have, you have to go and search for the fields of the packet and choose up extra cycles, and back in 1977, computer cycles were expensive, so that was a bad idea, we threw that out. And one group said, how about 128 bits? Okay, so I did the math, right? 128 bits, 3.4 times 10 to the 38th addresses. Why do we need 3.4 times 10 to the 38th addresses to do an experiment? This is what I thought we were doing was an experiment, and I thought if it worked, then we would do a production version after demonstrating that the technology worked. Well, the problem is the experiment didn't end, and so here we are in 2011 using the 1977 version of the Internet. So the answer is maybe I should have done 128, but at the time it didn't pass the red face test. <laughs> So I'm sorry about that, but I'm very Apology happy. Apology accepted. <laughs> yeah, but you know, on the other hand, uh, the, the fact that we could run V6 and V4 concurrently uh, is, a, is a really major milestone. And I want to uh, you know, emphasize to you that it is important to be able to run both at the same time for several reasons. First of all, some devices won't shift to V6 at the same time as others will, so you need to talk to both. Second, if you have a portable device, one which you are physically going to move from one locale to another, it may end up in a place where there's only V6 available, or a place where there's only V4 available, or more likely a place where both are available. It needs to be able to talk to both of them at the same time. So uh, one thing you can do to accelerate the, uh, the turning on of IPv6 is to ask for it, because the ISPs have been saying, nobody's asking for it. Of course, no one should have asked for it because most users haven't a clue about what's IP. They don't need to. They know about domain names and they know about the World Wide Web and that's all they should know. So having them ask for IPv6 is silly except that now you know that you need to ask for that and you should do so. It will alert the ISPs that there is a market demand for it. Uh, the Asia PAC group has exhausted all of its available IPv4 address space. ICANN, the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority part of it, has exhausted all of its available IPv4 address space to hand off to the regional internet registries. So we are in the period of time when we have to have IPv6 implemented. Okay, um, I wanted to, because two-factor authentication came up, I wanted to remind you about the NSTIC work that uh, is coming out of uh, Howard Schmidt's office at the White House. I'm a big fan of strong authentication. I'm a big fan of two-factor authentication, although I do have something to report to you as a hazard. Uh, at Google, uh, in part because of the various attacks that took place a year or so ago, uh, we use uh, two-factor authentication, and I have my little USB 
uh, gadget, which you plug into the USB port whenever you need a six-digit randomly generated address. You swipe your finger across the little dot and it generates six random digits and puts them into the application that's waiting for you to produce your one-time password. And the original version that I had was an LCD display. You push the button and it generated the six digits and then you type them in. And I thought, well, that's clumsy and you can make a mistake and if you don't do it fast enough, it'll change and you know it's all no annoying. So I said, it's much better to plug it into the USB port. Well, I have a Macintosh and I love Macs. I, you know, Apple has been a wonderful supplier of, of great uh, hardware and software. So I plug in uh, my little USB thing and it works great. Then I go somewhere where I don't have Wi-Fi access to the internet and I don't have Ethernet access to the internet. So I get out my Verizon radio data you know, link and I plug it in to the USB port. And then I discover that I can't plug this into the adjacent USB port because the Verizon thing is too fat. Now, if there's anybody here from Verizon, will you please make a skinnier data <laughs> module so that I can plug my USB uh, you know, generator, password generator in next to it. Now I have to go get one of those damn USB port expanders and carry that around with me along with all the other crap. I'm sorry, Did get a little, yeah, there's the thought. So uh, anyway, I do want to emphasize how important it is to use two-factor authentication, but I want you to distinguish between identi identity and identifier. These are distinct notions and it's really valuable to make a distinction. So if you have an identifier, it doesn't have to mean anything, it's just a random string but you can bind strong authentication to it. You can assert your identifier, and when you are challenged to say, is it yours, you can generate a one-time password, or you could respond to a cryptographic uh, random challenge using your public and, and private key pairs. The idea of strongly authenticating the identifier and not binding that uh, necessarily to identity is very useful, because now you can use that identifier to bind to a variety of levels of um, identification, of validation of identification. So I'd like to separate those two things. NIST has some standards, as you know, for, uh, for the government, and its standards right now bind those two things together. You have password and identity, and that's generally fairly weak, and then as you work your way up, you have stronger and stronger identity and identifiers bound to stronger and stronger authentication. If we separate those two things, we have a lot more flexibility and it's more applicable to the general uh, business case in the enterprise world. So I want you to, I know I gotta shut up here so you can ask some questions. Uh, machine translation, we have come so far that it's incredible. Back in the 1960s when I was at Stanford as an undergraduate, uh, the idea behind machine translation was that you would pour a dictionary into the computer and then you pour in one language and you expect the other language to come out. We tried it by going from English to Russian and back to English. And the one I liked the most was uh, out of sight, out of mind, which was translated into invisible idiot. So <laughs> right away we knew that this dictionary idea wasn't going to hack it and it's taken 40 years to get to where we are now. The guys at Google are, should be, uh, they are and should be very proud of what they've done in translation. NIST, again, the National Institutes for Standards and Technologies, has standard tests for the quality of translation. Google, in the last couple of years, has topped everyone in terms of quality of translation by that metric. So I'm very pleased to, to see that. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention, two things, uh, about um, the aug augmented uh, identification, uh, augmented proof that you are who you say you are. Sometimes people will say, you know, put in a secret uh, question and, and give us the secret answer. Well, we've all had the, the heard stories about people who put these things in, who the answers to which could be found by searching the internet. So one answer to this is lie. In other words, if you're asked what's your mother's maiden name, put in something else. Now the problem with that is if, if you don't remember what the lie was, you have a problem. <laughs> It, what, remember the expression, oh, what a tangled web we weave? It's, it is very applicable here, literally. Uh, so that's one possibility. Uh, I tried the Facebook mechanism, and I don't mean to go poke holes at Facebook, but I was in Europe once, and uh, this was an IP address I hadn't used before, so they said, we're not sure you are who you claim you are, your username and password isn't good enough. And so they started putting up pictures of people, and they said, who are these people? They were supposed to be my friends, right? Well, I have 5,000 friends on Facebook, <laughs> and I've never seen most of them, so I have no idea who the hell these people are. So I failed. You had to get 10 of them right, you know, before you could get a lot. I couldn't get any of them right. 
And I remember, you know, sending a nasty gram to some friends over there saying, you know, this is really not a very good way of making this work. And besides, now I can't get logged in. There was a better tactic would have been for me to say, show me a picture of Joe and I will tell you if it is Joe or not. Um, I don't know if they adopted that. Last point, um, stop badware. This is an organization that Google helped to found. Uh, it's spun out of the Berkman Center at uh, Harvard. Uh, their job is to help uh, infected websites get uninfected. When Google does the search and the index build on the net, we look for our software, downloads the web pages, downloads the home pages, and looks not only for the words to index and the links to follow, but they also try to figure out, or the software tries to figure out if there's any malware on that website. Now, it's a program that's doing this, so it's not always going to be right. But when it finds something that it, it thinks might be infectious, it makes a little notation for that particular web page. Um, when someone, and then when someone uses our search engine or a Chrome browser and happens to end up on one of those sites, we pop up a big bright red interstitial page saying, maybe you don't want to go there because we think there's software that might harm your computer. Of course, you're still allowed to go. I mean, you, we can't stop you from going anyway, but we make it hard. You have to cut and paste the URL instead of just clicking somewhere. Uh, however, the people who run the websites that are marked that way are often quite upset that they have been, you know, branded as having malware. And so we send them to Stop Badware uh, at Harvard, which is actually now spun out as a separate nonprofit. And they will help the uh, party whose site is infected, uh, de uh, disinfect it. Some of them will say, this is an outrage. It's an insult. We didn't put any bad software on here. How can you possibly say that? And of course, the answer is they didn't put anything on there. Somebody else broke through their weak security and put the malware on there for them. So, uh, so far, uh, it's been a very helpful uh, activity, but it's, uh, it's a battle that goes on and on. Okay, I'll shut up there. We've got lots more to talk about, but I'll let you ask some questions, and I'll get some from the rest of you. I'll but just thank throw you. in one, and then yeah, we'll okay. take it. So it's good to hear you discuss the concept of identifier versus identity, because starting about a year or so, the people at Facebook started making a very consistent case that essentially they want to provide that layer of authentication and identity that in their view is sort of missing from the internet's original design. Well, and okay, but I think that it's very important not to force people to identify themselves in order to have a strongly authenticated identifier. So we're in agreement about that. We are okay, in agreement, right, yes. Good. Now, this, the same thing has come up with newspaper websites where people complain about anonymous commenters. Well, if you have, you can tell who said what consistently, even if you don't know the real name, that can work just as well. So there is an identity, there, there is accountability but not necessarily. Not necessarily uh, identification. Yes. Okay, all right. That wasn't the question. Yeah, well, you, Did know, you have a question? just trying to get you on the record. Oh, all right. oh, oh yes. okay, all right. So actually, I'm sure you all have some better questions than I do. Where are the mics? There's one Maybe there. Maybe not. Don't be shy. Can you hear me? Okay. Marv Langston, uh, working with the Navy guys. Uh, we often, there's a lot of futurists around like Ray Kurzweil and Kevin Kelly and other guys that talk about where this future of this big internet world is gonna go. Um, so I was just wondering if you have any comments on that. So uh, are, are we thinking about the singularity as near in particular? Uh, so that's actually relevant to sort of the robotic stuff that uh, we just had a chance to see. Uh, I, uh, I know Ray and I like him and I think he, uh, he's quite enthusiastic about his, uh, his theories of uh, positive spirals. And so the short story is that uh, Ray believes that uh, we will develop computers that are smart enough that they will begin to design themselves and they will be, achieve the point where they are smarter than human beings are. And then, they'll then that robot will design robots that are smarter, smarter than the sum of all the human beings that have ever lived. Uh, and at somewhere along that time, maybe that's 2029 or 30 or something, uh, you'll be able to upload your personality into a computer. Now, this is his notion of immortality. Uh, so he wants to live long enough to get to the point that he can upload himself into a computer, and then he can go visit the galaxy because computers live longer than people do. Uh, I haven't quite gotten all the way to that point uh, in, in my thinking, but I would be, uh, I, I do believe that the computing power that's available to us does empower us in ways that we never could have been empowered before. But sheer numbers are not going to do it. So even if you had 10 to the 14th computers, and you argue that that's about as many synapses as you have in your brain or the number of uh, 
uh, you know, interconnections that are in the, in the brain, that doesn't necessarily produce intelligence. Uh, I have this funny feeling about uh, communication with anything, including a piece of software, that uh, relies on some kind of shared experience. So I have a, I have a very interesting experience that occurred to me last year. I met a woman named Patty Patterson. Penny started at Stanford University when I began teaching there in 73, but her project was to teach a gorilla, Coco, how to sign. Coco was about six months old when she started. Coco is now 35 or something like that, or whatever the numbers are, 73, mobile 37, 38. Uh, Coco can now sign uh, about 1,000 signs. Coco understands 2,000 spoken words, and it looks as if Coco actually can do some reading as well, which is really hard to believe, but she can point to the names of people who are her caretakers and say, I want this one to come. So I went up to see Penny and to talk to Coco, and there was no question in my mind that I was having an, an intentional conversation with Coco the gorilla. She, in fact, first she invited me to come over to see her. It's 50 feet away. She goes like this. This means come and visit. There was, there was no question about the intention behind that. And then after I got closer, she wanted to chase. Okay, well, they didn't let me into the cage to do that, so you know, I stayed outside. But she weighs about that 380. That's an interesting visual right there. Uh, I, well, you know, the question was, who's going to chase whom to begin with? You know, and, I, and I'm not really good at climbing. Uh, so I was outside. But the, the, there was clear intention in uh, this gorilla's communication. I felt like it was the first contact with an alien. If we ever got to the point where we could have that degree of intentional interaction with uh, robots, programmed robots, that would be pretty amazing just to begin with. But I'm afraid that I, I can't quite get to where Ray is on that. But there's no question that we can, we can see some serious evolutionary improvement. Um, but I wouldn't hold my breath. I hope I haven't offended you at all. No, good, okay. The, the downside of the singularity forecast goes by the, the phrase gray goo. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh. Okay, you had a hand up over here. Oh, Actually, come um, back there, okay. Then uh, Mike Geldner. Um, yeah. With the uh, latest uh, uh, developments that have occurred socially, uh, governments in the Middle East uh, having been overthrown effectively by social networking that's going on and all the mm -hmm. services that are available that, that enable that, uh, there have to be a whole lot of other governments that are very worried about this. Uh, we've seen some services being cut off. Uh, as the internet develops and becomes more popular and these services become more prolific in the civilized world and in, the, in the, the first world countries, do, do you think that there's going to be a further separation from third world countries that are trying to maintain control, absolute control, dictatorship type control over their people? Are we, are we going to separate ourselves further from them? Okay, let, uh, let me tell you that I'm hearing impaired and the echo is a little tough for me, so I may need some help to make sure I heard all of that. But this is a social networking issue, and you're worried about governments cutting people off? Or? Right, and that, and that uh, further separating us from third world countries or, or inhibiting their development. Okay, so this is um, a, an interesting policy phenomenon. Uh, the Internet has this deliberately designed property that it doesn't recognize national boundaries, for example. Uh, and that was designed because when it was being designed for the military, the whole notion was that the military was, you shouldn't, for example, you wouldn't have to go, you don't want to have to go to country X, which you're about to attack, and say, excuse me, I, could you allocate me some IP address space <laughs> so that I can build my command and control system so I can attack you tomorrow on Tuesday? That, you know, I didn't think that was going to be a very good design mechanism. So we said it should be uh, topologically related. So first, we ignored national boundaries. Second, uh, it's intended to, uh, that the, the net's design has the property that it wasn't designed to do anything in particular. And this is, by the way, not a bad tactic. Because if you don't design it to do anything in particular, then if it doesn't do X, you don't get blamed for that. But what is important is that it doesn't know what it's doing. It has no clue about what the packets mean. And the packets themselves don't know how they're being carried. So this design, I'll come around to, to get to where you want to go. The design is intended to sweep in new technology in the communication space and switching space above, below the level of packets. 
And because the packets don't know what they're doing other than carrying bits from one place to the other, at the edges of the net, it's the interpretation of the bits that produce the uh, applications. So the net is this uh, huge platform for inventing new applications. And in some ways, this freedom that you have to build applications, to express yourself, and do all these other things is a threat in some regimes where sharing of information is considered a threat. Now, I, you know, you hear this term, in, uh, information is power. Maybe it's knowledge is power. But if, you, if you use the term information is power, I actually reject that as a strong formulation. It's information sharing that's power. That's what we've learned at Google. That's what the World Wide Web has taught us. So uh, the question now is, what can, uh, can we do anything to assure that the users of the net will continue to have access to it? We know from example that it's possible to kill pieces of the internet. It happened in Egypt. And the reason it was killed is that, or the, the way it was killed, is simply to turn off the underlying transmission system. Uh, you can't do anything about that. The packets can't carry themselves. Something has to carry them. On the other hand, if that were to have persisted long enough, I am pretty sure that there would be a variety of ways of reconstituting a good portion of the communication system. One thing is across national borders, Wi-Fi, satellite downlinks, um, even another technology which has uh, um, been developed out of, uh, okay, so don't go crazy when I tell you this. Uh, ARPA uh, helped support a project to design an interplanetary extension of the internet. And this is starting around 1998, around 2000. Well, I've been very involved in that. NASA uh, has used a technique like this to support the rovers on Mars. It's really store and forward communication. So we call it delay and disruption tolerant networking. We've tested it in tactical military environments, but to take the Egyptian case just as an example, if that situation had persisted, the delay and disruption tolerant design would literally allow you to transmit data whenever a link became available, even if it was literally a point-to-point -point Bluetooth or point-to-point Wi-Fi link or maybe even a dial-up telephone call, and then hold on to the data until another link is available somewhere. And so you keep storing and forwarding information. It's not real time, it's not low latency, but it gets information back and forth. And if the information is a video clip or an audio message or a piece of text, eventually it makes its way out or makes its way in. So honestly, I think that uh, if you believe that you can keep the internet permanently disabled anywhere, think twice. It ain't gonna happen. There's a question over there. So um, on a given day, I use anywhere between four or five different devices, operating systems, and just as many browsers. Uh, how important do you think uh, interoperability is in terms of continuing a cohesive internet experience, if you will? Okay, wait a minute. Uh, how important do I think? Interoperability. Inter is. Oh, I worship at the altar of interoperability. <laughs> uh, there, there, is, there is nothing more important than interoperability for several reasons. First of all, absent interoperability, it's very hard to create a competitive environment with multiple products that interwork. The internet's design was intended to promote interoperability sufficient that anyone who could build a piece of internet, uh, according to the protocols, could interconnect with anybody else and it would work. Now, of course, you have to find somebody that wants to interconnect with you, but the reason you can talk to two billion machines on the internet is because they all use the same TCP IP standards. Interoperability at the higher layers of protocol confers an even greater value. So let's talk about infrastructure. Let's look at the cloud, which my friends uh, hate when I say that clouds are really just time sharing on steroids. And you know, they, they think that trivializes clouds and in some ways it does, but it isn't a bad model. It's a shared resource. So why is it such an important infrastructure? Well, somebody else can build the cloud. That's what we did, that's what Google, um, Microsoft does, that's what Amazon does. Somebody else invests in the cloud and then makes it available to you. So you can build applications like the App Engine without having to invest in building the underlying infrastructure if you have access to it. So clouds are really important infrastructure that other people can take advantage of. It lowers the barrier to uh, introduction of new innovative ideas but it also creates a certain amount of interworking. So if you build things on top of World Wide Web, for example, and you're all using HTTP or HTTPS, and using XML or HTML or HTML5, 
then you, those standards create interoperability that lets people's work interoperate even if you didn't have a pairwise negotiation. And so the big power of standards is that it lets you interoperate without having a, a prior agreement, without having to have pairwise negotiations with two million other people. So interoperability for me is the only way that we get to leverage our investments in infrastructure. And uh, you can see the consequences of uh, Android on mobiles, or for that matter, the iPhone and, and so on. The app stores are evidence of the, the value of separating the infrastructure and, uh, from the applications by establishing standards and APIs, because it allows so many new ideas to be tried out. In the back There's there. one in the back, and then we'll get one in the front. Okay, yes. Hi, uh, Ken Jones from the Uniform Services University. I have two questions. One is, I'm assuming that the early work that you did, the team at BBNN, Xerox Park, when you guys came to work, you didn't realize that what you were building was going to, you know, that you are going to be on stage looked at like this in 30 years. When did you know that TCP IP was what it became? And then two, in your opinion, Who's doing that work today that in 30 years okay. they're going to be up there? Two really good questions. So um, one, you know, of course, the, the easy answer is, well, we knew exactly what we were doing and it's all <laughs> happening. But, you know, you know, I'm not surprised at anything. Uh, honestly, we knew, I will tell you that we knew that we were dealing with extremely powerful technology. Now, let me say very specifically, Bob Kahn and I worked together on ARPANET along with a whole lot of other people, Larry Roberts and Bob Taylor and gosh, a whole bunch of others, Steve Crocker. Um, and so we had the benefit of that experience. Now, when we start the internet work, it's 1973. What has happened by that time? Well, email has been invented, or at least network email has been invented a year or two before. We saw that take off like a rocket. That was sort of early social networking in many respects. Uh, we had seen Doug Engelbart's work at uh, SRI International, the online system, the mouse, the portrait mode display, the pointing, and hyperlinking in that one system. That was sort of World Wide Web in one box. Uh, we had seen Xerox Park. Okay, my lab at Stanford is a mile and a half from Xerox Park. I have students working there. I have people from Xerox coming and sitting on, I'm on their committees and so on. What did we see? We saw the invention of the Ethernet in May of 1973. We saw the Alto machine. We saw the Bravo editor. I mean, we saw, in some ways, as I mean, I would give credit to Xerox Park, they were living in 1972 or 73, 20 years in the future. We saw all of that, okay, while we're trying to figure out how to get this internet thing to do. So I don't uh, take any credit at all for the application space that was unfolding during that time except to say that we realized that if we could get an arbitrarily large number of networks of all kinds, packet nets of all kinds to interwork, that we could spread that capability everywhere. Now, did we have any idea that PCs would you know, become infinitely popular or that we would be carrying mobiles around that are you know, more powerful than a supercomputer in 1972? No, I don't think we did that. But we certainly knew that we were dealing with something incredibly powerful. When did I realize that this thing was a big deal? 1988, I have a very clear memory of this. I'm walking into an interop show. This was a show started by Dan Lynch, it meant interoperability, and there was always a show net, and you couldn't show up at the interop exhibition without putting your equipment on the show net and showing it actually worked with everybody else's. It was a fabulous demonstration of the interoperability of TCP IP in, a, you know, in all these different implementations. So anyway, I'm walking into this show with Eric Benamou, who at the time was the CEO of uh, 3Com. And I see this giant two-story Cisco display. This is 1988, right? Cisco's probably two years old by that time, or three or something. And I turned to Eric, and I said, Eric, how much do these displays cost? And he said, well, it could be a quarter of a million dollars. And then there's you know, the cost of the people to man it for the week and everything else could be any, up to half a million dollars. And I just stood there with my jaw dropping, thinking, God, somebody thinks they're actually going to make money out of the internet. And the, yeah. wow. So right at that moment, I realized that if I wanted the general public to have access to the internet, 
that I needed to do something to break a big policy logjam because up until that time, you know, the internet goes live in 1983, it takes us 10 years to get to the point where we launch. 83 to 88, it's strictly used by government and academic sector. And I'm sitting here thinking, how do I get the general public online? The US government can't afford to pay for everybody's access to the internet, not gonna happen. So how can I allow commercial traffic on the government-sponsored backbones so as to demonstrate that there's a market for this service and then get the private sector to invest in building more. So I went to the Federal Networking Council in 1988 and I said, um, would it be okay if we hooked up the MCI mail commercial email service, which I had built in 1983, to the internet? And you know, there's this hubbub of conversation and finally the answer comes back and says, okay, one year we can have this test. So we you know, run off and by middle of 1989, we announced that we can get the MCI mail commercial system to interact with all the email people on the internet. As soon as we make the announcement, two things happen. Everybody else who has commercial email says, well, those MCI guys can't have this special position. So CompuServe and Telemail and OnTime all come up on the net. And what happens? They were separate, independent, non-interoperable systems, except now they could talk to each other through the internet because they had to be uh, use the common email uh, formats for, uh, for internet mail. So that was one little surprise. The second thing is that three commercial internet service providers arrive in 1989. PSI net, UUNet, and SurfNet out, I just had my name but I didn't have anything to do with it, out in uh, San Diego. So 1988-89 was a major milestone in transforming the internet from its or origins as an academic and military thing into an engine of commercial development. You know what happened to uh, PSINet and UUNet? What, what did become of SurfNet? Well, that was really interesting. Uh, it was originally built by General Atomics. It was acquired by a company called TCG, which was later acquired by AT&T. And since AT&T didn't appear to be using the SurfNet, by the way, it was originally supposed to be SURFNet. And, you know, surfing and all that. And they had a whole ad campaign with T-shirts and everything else. Then they found out that somebody in the Netherlands had already built a network called SURFNet. And so they called me up and they said, uh, we're going to rename ourselves the California Educational Research Foundation. How clever. Network. <laughs> I said, okay. And my first thought was, gee, if they screw it up, well, I'll be, maybe I'll be embarrassed. And then I thought, well, wait a minute. People name their kids after other people. And if the kids don't come out right, they don't blame the people they name them after. <laughs> so I said... What the hell, sure. So they called it SurfNet, and I flew out and broke one of those plastic bottles that filled with glitter, you know, uh, in Hollywood champagne, right, over a Cisco router to launch the network. So that one ended up at AT&T, and I called AT&T while I was still at MCI, big mistake. <laughs> and I said, can I buy my name back? And they said, no. <laughs> so the answer is, it's still around, but it owns, it's owned by AT&T. I see. Okay. I think we've just run out of time, or have we? I don't know, it's up to you, um, sir. You're, you're the guest of honor. Okay, oh. he, get, he gets lost. I get the last no, I'm the blabbermouth. What? <laughs> so I'll give you a good one, uh, Vin. Uh, we all read recently about a, a tech company uh, in the United States buying the internet allocation from a uh, defunct oh, right. tech yes. company. Yes. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Is, is that a positive or a negative thing for internet okay. governance so, moving forward? Thank you. That's actually a very relevant question. Uh, all of you, you know, remember now, we've run out of IPv4 address space, so it's now in uh, uh, demand. Um, Nortel, a uh, Canadian company, uh, went bankrupt some time ago, and it, its assets are being uh, disposed of uh, to maximize value, which is, is normal practice for a bankruptcy court. I happen to sit on the board of uh, Aaron, the uh, America's Registry for Internet Numbers now, so we were apprised of the planned allocation and sale of IPv4 address space through the bankruptcy court. Uh, the big problem from my point of view is that treating internet addresses as if they are property is a very, very bad idea. And the reason for this is several fold. First of all, if it's property, then in theory, you can do whatever you want to with it, including slicing it up into little pieces and selling it to different people. And I don't object to people trying to monetize this. That's not my problem. My problem is that if you try to break up the uh, address space in a non-hierarchical way, you will increase the size of the routing tables dramatically, which could affect everybody in the whole world. So this is not just a, a pairwise transaction that has no effect on everybody else. It has a potentially very bad effect. 
So uh, uh, our attorney, Aaron, was actually able to persuade Microsoft, which was the acquirer, and the bankruptcy court that what should happen is that the transaction takes place, but the assignment of address space goes through the policies that we are normally apply at Aaron for any allocation of address space. So that set an important precedent. I hope we can stick with that because there will be other uh, uh, bankruptcies and other attempts to sell. Uh, but I think it's very important not to allow I internet address space or IP address space to be treated literally as property. It should be treated as something that you have the right to lease and use, but when you stop paying your lease, you don't have the control over that. It goes back into the pool. I could make the same argument for domain names, but I have to admit that by now domain names are in practice being treated as if they're property, but it is correct that if you stop paying for the registration of a domain name, it goes into a pool, but today it often ends up being auctioned off, which is being treated in a way like property. I don't like that, but I think it's less harmful than treating IP address space as property. I hope we never do that ever for V6 and for V4. Thank you for that question, it was a good one. Okay. All right. Well, we've now gone 10 minutes over, so. Oh, I guess we'll okay, I'm sorry. We have one other Google speaker, and I don't want to cut him off. Okay, well, thank you all. I appreciate the thank time. Thank you. Good.